been around the internet long enough to have scoured odd forums on 4chan and Reddit, you may have heard term tulpa. Tulpa is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal of an object or being that is created through spiritual or mental powers. Modern practitioners, who call themselves tulpamancers, use the term to refer to a type of willed imaginary friend. But unlike imaginary friends, tulpas are entities generated entirely in the mind. For example, some believe tulpas think on their own, experience emotions and have memories. Tulpas generate personalities, desires and curiosities all their own, quite separate from their host, which practitioners consider them to be sentient and relatively independent. One of the most fascinating accounts of a tulpa was written by French explorer, Alex and David Neal. David Neal had spent years studying Tibetan religion and mysticism, and had begun to write books to both explain the ideas behind these systems, as well as to share her own personal adventures of traveling in a distant land. In 1929 she published Mystique Set Magicians du Thibet in French. It was soon released in English as Magic and Mysticism in Tibet. Among other things, this book told of David Neal's own encounters with a Tibetan spiritual phenomenon named Sprul Pa which she chose to write as Tulpa. According to David Neal, a Tulpa is a type of spiritual energy created illusion. It can appear to be anything and be mistaken for something real. If they are based on a living being, these illusions can be solid and, in extreme cases, take on a life of their own and even outlive their creator. Tulpas are either made by a spiritual being or by a person who can correctly imagine the thing they want to represent as if it were real. It was believed that tulpas were used by various spirits and deities in Tibet to create self-portraits for people to interact with. It was also believed that these illusions could be created with varying degrees of skill by some highly trained lamas holy people. Beyond that, if a person concentrated on a single thought for an excessive amount of time, even regular people might occasionally create an accidental tulpa. David Neal offered four examples from her own experience to help explain how this worked. In David Neal's employ, a young Tibetan named Wang Du was granted leave for three weeks to visit his family. When he got back, he was supposed to buy food and supplies, hire porters, and lead the caravan back to David Neal's camp. But after two months, David Neal thought he was just not coming back. David Neal then had a dream one night about the young man returning with a foreign sun hat that he had never owned before. One of David Neal's servants showed up the next morning to tell her that Wang Du had returned and was just down the hill. He slowly walked up the path that wound back and forth on the slope, ascending from the valley below, and she recognized him. The hat she had seen him wearing in her dream was, of course, on him. The servant assumed Wang Du had simply walked ahead of the caravan and that they would soon be seen as well because David Neal noted that Wang Du did not have a caravan or luggage with him. Wang Du was also observed by two other David Neal employees as he ascended the slope. After that, the young man went behind a lonely chord in a small religious structure and never came back. The chordon was mostly a 3 by 3 foot square at its base, with a pointed top, and stood about 7 feet tall. Everyone assumed that Wang Du had sat down next to it for a brief rest because it was solid concrete and there was nowhere else on the barren landscape for a person to hide behind it. However, after a sufficient amount of time had passed, David Neal sent two servants to find him while she watched through binoculars. Wang Du was absent. He was not present. Wang Du came back, this time for real, just before sunset on the same day. In the dream as well as in his earlier appearance, he was seen walking with the anticipated caravan and sporting a new hat. Before anyone else could speak, David Neal asked Wang Du and the porters questions right away. Their responses made it abundantly clear that Wang Du had traveled with the caravan the entire way and had started the day too far away for any of them to reach the camp before dusk. Later, when we inquired at the various stops on the way to the camp about when they arrived and left each, this was further confirmed. Wang Du also accompanied the caravan the entire way. David Neal came to the same conclusion about her dream and the vision of Wang Du that she had shared with three other observers. 
They were both unintentional tulpas made by Wang Du, possibly out of concern about how late he was getting the supplies. David Neal was visited by a painter she knew who specialized in depictions of vengeful deities and was fascinated by them. She could see that one of these terrifying deities was closely following him as he came closer to her on this particular day. The artist stepped toward her to inquire about what was going on, but the figure did not follow him and remained where it had first been seen. He had no idea why she looked startled. She pushed past the artist, according to David Neal, and reached out to touch the strange figure. I paraphrase. The vision then vanished as if I had touched a soft object whose material gave way when I gently pushed on it. The artist admitted to performing rituals to call the deity before creating a painting of him. It appeared that either the deity heard him and appeared as a misty tulp or that the man's obsession with the figure created a spiritual double who was following him that day. He had spent the entire morning working on the painting. David Neal had become friends with a lemon named Rinpoche, and he frequently visited her camp to talk to her. When David Neal's cook asked for some food that was in her tent, they both went to her tent to get the food. They both noticed that Lama Rinpoche was seated in a folding chair next to David Neal's tent at the camp table. Because he needed to prepare tea for the visiting Lama first, the cook stated that he would retrieve the provisions later. David Neal walked over to greet Lama Rinpoche as the cook returned to the kitchen, looking at him as she approached. However, a strange event occurred just a few steps from the tent. A flimsy veil of mist seemed to open before at the tent, like a curtain that is slowly pulled aside, David Neal said. Furthermore, Lama Rinpoche had left. Instantly, David Neal informed him that the Lama had only come to pass on a brief message when the cook arrived shortly after with the tea. She was afraid that the cook would be scared if she told him what had happened. David Neal was later able to tell Lama Rinpoche about this during a real visit. The Lama laughed, but he didn't say anything. He pulled a variation on the same trick on her another time, completely disappearing from view while they were conversing in the middle of a vast open field with nowhere to hide. In David Neal's implication, she was visited by a tulp of Lama Rinpoche in both instances which was helpful for him if he could not travel to her location. David Neal decided to attempt to make a tulip after seeing one and learning theoretically how they were made. As a result, she kept to herself and practiced the various rituals and methods she had learned. She decided to imagine a short, fat monk, someone innocent and happy, as the subject of her experiment. The first part of her experiment took several months to complete, and it involved creating a fully realized mental image of the happy monk. She practiced imagining this monk doing the things that a real person would do around them all the time, and over time, her image of him became stable and real. During this stage of the test, she shared an apartment with this monk, who was essentially a guest. David Neal ended her isolation at this point and began her country tour with her servants and tents. Her perception was that the monk's illusion persisted, and as they traveled, he frequently appeared to include himself in the group by performing actions that would be expected of travelers. David Neal could now see the monk and take action without actively considering him. Stranger still, she could now occasionally feel the monk, his robe rubbed against her, and she thought she felt his hand on her shoulder at one point. A little more alarmingly, the monk's features began to shift as the illusion began to act on its own and become more than just a visual illusion. He became shorter and meaner in appearance. Likewise, he began to become more troublesome and bold. David Neal's fictitious monk was getting out of hand. David Neal received a present of butter from a herdsman one day and the herdsman noticed the tulpa in her tent. He simply assumed she was having a lamb over. It would appear that this incident marked David Neal's turning point. She concluded that she had to put an end to the experiment because the out of control tulpa was beginning to appear to other people. It took her six months to complete the effort to dissolve the tulpa, which meant putting an end to her own ingrained belief in its existence. Before David Neal mentioned the tulpas of Tibet in 1929, the idea that human thought might be able to create visible and or tangible forms had been theorized. 
In the late 1800s, several people in Europe and the United States suggested that such an effect, known as a thought form, might explain how ghosts showed up and how people could be seen in two places at once. The majority of this theory was put forth either in works published by the Societies for Psychical Research in the United Kingdom and the United States or in various theosophical works, and failed to capture the public's attention in either instance. However, David Neal's account of the phenomenon certainly caught the attention of the general public. This was partly due to the rising interest in various magazines that were devoted to weird, mystical, and paranormal true stories as well as the general popularity of stories about Mystic Tibet at the time she published her book. As a result, David Neal's tulpas, particularly the account of the tulpa she claimed to have created herself, became the primary example of what a thought form was from that point on. However, the downside of this was that the phenomena themselves were now largely presented only in the context of the creation of a tangible living being from thought, and all other possible connected phenomena were generally ignored. Since then, several people have held the belief that if a single person can make a tulpa, then a large group of people's shared belief could make a similar tulpa, from visions of holy figures to uncatchable monsters like Bigfoot and Nessie. This collective tulpa idea has been proposed as the basis for a wide range of strange occurrences. Unfortunately, David Neal's description of the meticulous process by which an individual creates a tulpa suggests that it is unlikely that a group of beliefs would be precise enough for a sufficient amount of time to create a functional animal. As a theory, this is a huge stretch, especially considering that no one has yet demonstrated that tulpas exist. Nonetheless, if tulpas do exist, they may indicate a mechanism that enables spirits to manifest and living things to produce a wide range of paranormal phenomena. But how can such an idea be tested and proven?